Echeverria. Uh, I'm the user experience design lead for the Google Assistant. Um, and I obviously work for Google and I'm here to speak about um, ethical design for AI systems and how we avoid um, how we avoid in injecting harmful bias into um, AI and machine learning systems. The Google Assistant is, of course, Google's probably most preeminent or well-known um, AI product. Um, and so it's, this is a very important topic for my team um, as we develop this product for as many users as possible to be inclusive of as many users as possible. Um, okay, so this talk is in three parts. We'll talk about how bias is human how machine bias comes from humans and what we can do about it. And this talk is really optimized for people who are software designers, user experience designers, so people who are developing um, products on top of AI and are designing the end user interfaces for them. Um, so the last part, which is the most important, is about the principles of design um, that for, for ethical design for AI from a user experience perspective. But just taking a look at how bias works has affected our systems for quite a long time. Um, here are two examples that are essentially the same type of bias entering an analog system in the 1940s and a digital one in 2017. So in the 40s, um, Kodak films used primarily Caucasian models to optimize or calibrate their film, which meant that darker, darker skin subjects did not show up properly in their developed film. In 2017, an app called FaceApp had a similar problem where they trained their AI algorithm um, on primarily Caucasian models. So when it optimized to beautify a model, it really just made them look more Caucasian. So same problem in two very different systems, but an illustration that bias has been within our systems for uh, a long time before AI ever entered them. And digital bias really can have very significant real world effects. Right. So, for example, if your phone wasn't trained to understand your accent in an emergency situation, that could be potentially life threatening. Um, or we've seen this play out in news feed, uh, news feeds around the world tended to present skewed views of the world or inaccurate information that can influence everything from elections to the future of nation states. So systemic bias affects human lives in very real ways and bias uh, AI is now within the systems that determine whether we can get a credit card or a mortgage or whether we end up going to prison in some cases for a crime. So it's, it's very, very important that we eradicate the bias from these systems uh, as, as much as we can because it can have very drastic effects on, on real people. And systemic bias really affects the way we see the world. Um, this is a screenshot from Bing. Uh, if you enter the word physicist into the Bing search engine and look at the image results, you'll see that they're primarily men. You have to scroll down a couple of times before you see any images of women. Um, and if we're presented with results like this consistently in the world through our systems, then we, became, we become biased to believe that scientists are predominantly male or that only males can be scientists. Bias is actually a very human trait, and that's why it's extremely difficult to eradicate from our systems. It's an adaptation um, that evolution has built into our brains to make us more efficient, and we'll talk briefly about why that is. So humans are live-wired for learning. Um, what I mean by that is that uh, other species on the planet tend to be hardwired to work within the environments that they're born into. So baby sharks are born swimming and baby giraffes are born running or they can run within minutes of being born. Whereas human beings, um, we are live wired to adapt to any environment, which means, for example, language is a good example. A uh, human baby can has the potential to learn Mandarin, Swahili, Urdu, uh, Spanish, but if it's born into a household that speaks predominantly English, it will start to optimize um, uh, for, their, the, the baby's brain will start to optimize for English language learning, uh, which is what the process of learning is. So as, as we get older, our brains actually reinforce certain biases. For example, the bias towards our native language or a bias to prefer certain foods. Um, and the number of synaptic connections in the brain goes few, uh, becomes fewer and fewer as we age in order to strengthen those biases and deprecate the synaptic connections that aren't necessary for our survival. And the reason for that is that bias makes us more efficient, makes our brains more efficient. So for example, if you were to 
measure the brain activity of someone who's just learning how to drive, their brain waves would register at the gamma or super conscious level because they're concentrating on every last detail and they're expending all their cognitive energy on learning how to drive. But when they become an experienced driver, they can get behind the wheel and their brains will register at an alpha or subconscious level, which means that their brains aren't, concerned, aren't, aren't using as much energy to complete that task and they can be using that energy to focus on other things. So bias is actually, a, can be a very good thing, which is why it's so difficult to eradicate from our systems. So machine bias is anthropogenic, meaning it comes from human beings. And at this point, I'd like to talk a little bit about how neural networks work at a very basic level so that we can understand how human bias enters our systems. <clears throat> so I apologize for the language on this screenshot, but this is a very kind of jarring example. AIs mimic their human teachers. Um, this is an AI called Tay that was rolled out by Microsoft a few years ago on Twitter. And it was only live for about 24 hours because it was live learning from really the worst of Twitter users. And by the end of 24 hours, it was saying things like this. Um, this is why, by the way, you know, um, companies these days don't really do kind of uh, very open-ended um, learning in the wild, so to speak. We do controlled, uh, controlled training by end users, but not this kind of total open-ended model because it can result in potentially catastrophic results, such as the one you see here. So there are four essential stages in how an AI learns. First, we gather data and we use that data um, to train the model. We take examples of all of the types of things that we want in the world. A lot of this data is often gathered from the internet because there's so much of it out there. And we use that data to train specific machine learning models to understand a certain concept. And that concept might be what factors constitute a fraudulent credit card um, transaction or what movies is this person gonna wanna watch. Um, after the model is trained, it then creates output in the form of more data, such as your Netflix recommendations or your Amazon recommendations. And that output is then consumed by human beings who are then in a certain sense, a very real sense, trained again, um, to f trained by that information in order to have those biases reinforced. So here's some examples of how that works. Let's say you were training a very simple machine learning model to understand whether a drawing is a drawing of a shoe. And you trained it mostly on drawings of shoes that look like the blue shoe on the right, but uh, you didn't feed it enough data to look like the high heeled shoe. So it would not learn to recognize that shoes with the high heel are actually also shoes, right? So a very simple example of how uh, uh, an, an imbalance in the data entered into a machine learning model can produce inaccurate outputs. After we enter that data into, into a machine learning model, um, how it works is say, again, you're trying to, you're trying to train a, an AI to, to determine whether something is a shoe or not a shoe. Um, the, there's a human being who ends up grading the output at the end. So if the, if, the, if the machine says, yes, it's a shoe, then the human engineer or trainer says that is correct or that output is not correct. And if it's not correct, then the machine goes back and recalculates all of its all of those nodes in the middle until it comes back with a correct answer. Um, and that model at the end, uh, the model training at the end is done by a human being with his or her own biases. So that's another point where biases might be able to enter the system. And then finally, after uh, an AI model is trained, it outputs um, a certain a certain conclusion, right? And in, for instance, here's uh, that same example we had before where we say, where we show a, a bunch of scientists from Isaac Newton to, I think that's Darwin, who happen to be men with Marie Curie being the sole female example. So it outputs a conclusion that scientists are generally male. And a human user might end up ingesting that conclusion and inheriting the same bias. And then later entering that bias back out into the world with their own information, which then is also consumed by the next generation of technology or AI. And so this becomes a self-perpetuating cycle of reinforcing bias. So what can we do to break that cycle? Um, as software engineers and user experience designers, how can we architect our systems um, and design the end user interfaces so that users have a voice um, in these systems and that we are accounting for the voices of all types of people? Um, 
On our team, we like to, and this is not Google official, but this is sort of my unofficial set of principles that I like to sort of reinforce when we design our systems here. We like to think of three key things, uh, or try to remember three key principles. One, the human is the teacher. Two, control is greater. Human control is greater than machine automation. And third, we always want to design for transparency. We'll go into a little bit of detail as to what that means. Um, the human is the teacher. So, we really want to be able to ensure that we are um, giving end users the ability to, uh, to, to, to provide feedback into the system and really essentially to train the machine models themselves. So it, we enter a, a dangerous world if the only people training AI algorithms are people who sit in offices at Google like me in Silicon Valley, right? So the solution to that is to be able to open up our systems so that all people using them, uh, all, all people using our products have the ability to also have their say in training the model. For example, if I was a Bing user and I was looking at that search result interface, uh, search results uh, list of images that shows that physicists are predominantly male, if there was just a button there that could say, I don't think this feedback is, I, I don't, I, I believe that these results are biased or reflect a certain type of bias and here's why. And if the system could then ingest that feedback and use it to retrain the system, and if it got enough of that feedback from enough users, then it would begin to understand that it needed to recalculate itself and correct that bias over time. Another thing we uh, like to remember is that human control is really more important than machine automation in the user experience. And this is something that goes against really like the last 20 years of software design and user experience design. Um, we have spent the last two decades trying to automate everything and make everything as fast and frictionless as possible. Hence the, you know, hence Netflix giving you recommendations, you know, based on things that it's observed or a really a better example is the Amazon, you know, uh, buy now button, which you just click something and you don't have to enter any other information. It just orders the thing for you, right? We're now entering a time, um, I think, where um, extreme automation can potentially be dangerous. And we need to be able to slow down and give users the ability to say, uh, no, I don't want this, or yes, I want this, or at least at the very least understand what decisions the AI is making behind the scenes um, so that they can kind of they can tweak those controls up and down. Um, and that has a lot to do with the last one, which is designing for transparency, meaning how do we provide the rationale for the decisions that we make? So for example, um, uh, let's say I, I've been listening to Baroque classical music for the past two years on my Spotify account, and then suddenly Spotify sees that there's a lot of death metal that's being played on my account. Spotify could make the assumption that I now don't like Baroque music, I like death metal and start recommending a bunch of death metal to me, or it could expose this and say, I'm 5% sure that maybe somebody else has been using, who somebody else who likes death metal has been using your Spotify account, and that's why I'm 95% sure that you still like primarily classical music. And then a user would have the ability to say, yes, that's correct. Um, so understanding what are the inputs that go into those things. When I get uh, a recommendation for a movie or if I get approved or not approved for a mortgage or a house loan, like what are the factors that the system is actually looking at? What is the data that is correlated with me and my profile? Um, open up that black box and help us understand, help users understand that calculation and then help them tweak those pieces of data as best that they can so that these systems work better for them and eliminate any other, and eliminate biases that are, uh, uh, that are harmful um, to their output. And then finally, and this is, has less to do with the design of the software and more of the design of, uh, of our organizations, is that it's really important for us, we're finding, especially on our team, um, to look for uh, to, to look for diversity within the people that we work with, um, but also the people that we kind of test our products with, uh, our, our end users. And it's not just intrinsic or cultural, right? Not intrinsic things, meaning things like gender or cultural, things like background, um, but also cognitive diversity. So what are the types of people um, who use our software? How do they think? Are they, are they creative? Are they analytical? Uh, do, they do they see the world visually? Do they, are they most responsive through language? Those are the types of things that we like to investigate so that we understand um, uh, how to build software that works for everybody. 
these are just some examples of the types of backgrounds that we have in our team. There are people who really come from all of these backgrounds because when we're creating a digital assistant like Google Assistant, it needs to be able to tell you a joke, but it also needs to understand what a trendy fashion store is near you. It needs to understand uh, what a good recipe is for sourdough bread, right? So we hire lots of different types of people and we bring input from lots of different types of people in order to make our, our product um, as, as kind of more comprehensively human as possible. Um, this last slide I like to end on because I think it's an interesting encapsulation of how complex it is to be a human being. These are three photographs of, um, of different types of tears under a microscope. Um, the first type, and they're very different because they're chemically different. So the first type is um, the types of tears that your eye just uses to lubricate itself, which is primarily saline. Uh, the, middle si the middle slide there, I believe, is uh, the types of um, the type of tear that your eye produces in response to irritation, such as smoke or slicing onions, and that that type of tear contains a lot of antibodies, and that's why it's chemically different from the first type. Oh. And the third type of tear is a um, is the tear that we cry in response to grief or or extreme emotion, um, and it contains uh, you know it, it contains um, um, certain chemicals that make us hyperventilate, for example, right? So the the, com the it's something as simple as a tear has so much dimension and complexity to it. Uh, that there's so much more to the human experience that we need to accommodate for. Um, and we need to keep that in mind that we can't be designing systems that are, that are single dimensional. Um, we need to understand that users are, uh, every human being is very complex and different human beings have many different types of needs. And we need to create systems that everybody can train and that will therefore work for all types of people. Thank you.